one time a homeless man called me Bieber, and I was like, maybe it's time to grow the bangs out. I'd consider myself a hairstylist rather than purely a barber, and I think there's a lot of correlation between music and sort of fashion and style, and there's a great crossover um, in that. Historically, um, I think people have wanted to emulate sort of talented, famous, glamorous people, and more so um, with musicians over actors. I shoot for different publications from French Vogue, American Vogue, uh, Italian Vogue, British Vogue, Dazed and Confused, ID. When you're flipping through fashion magazines, you're going you're gonna to find more connections to work being inspired by music. There's not a set language that is used between the different people on the team, from the makeup artist, the hairdresser, the stylist. So references have become the language that we all speak. I find that music references have always been a better way for me to communicate to the team than through film or through art. I think, you know, that the rock star should really have their own individual style and then they should influence what fashion does because, I mean, you know, who can say more than, you know, a rock star can? Even though this is on my head, I would never be able to recreate. Oh, I'm so hair challenged. <laughs> sort of listen to what we're doing creatively and then think of style and fashion that's going to connect with that aesthetic. Well, when Sarah and I started playing music professionally, we had just graduated high school, we were 18. I think the best way to describe our image was to say we didn't have one. I love popping colors, I love shiny stuff like this. I feel like it complements my music. Okay, come into my closet. So we think about style as like a visual language. I love clothes, I love dressing up. I love when people express themselves to a high degree that's like in your face all the time, like broadcasting their personality. I feel like style is transformative and you can come alive. This is the face the public wants. An ex-art student from Brixton, whose dad worked for Dr. Bernardo's homes, has turned himself into a bizarre, self-constructed freak. Impromptu, isn't it? It is a sign of our times that a man with a painted face and carefully adjusted lipstick should inspire adoration from an audience of girls aged between 14 and 20. In London, even, by the, even within a couple of months of the release of Ziggy Stardust. Um, kids walking around with the hairdo, funny clothes, the makeup. I mean, the, uh, the feminization of the male got well underway. I worked in a salon in Beckenham. Worked in various salons, but I ended up in the one in Beckenham, which is where I met Mrs. Jones, David Bowie's mother. She was my regular, would come and get her hair set every week and talk to me about a fabulous son and how great he was and it wasn't until David and Andrew were walking down Beckenham High Street with their child, their very ba the tiny baby, he was dressed, he was in a dress, she was in pants and a little leather jacket and suburban Beckenham in 1971, that was quite a shock. I mean I love this David Bowie image, it's just everything about it is 
pretty bananas that like the wide leg trouser and like the blue sun and like the beige and I love that tone and the tonality so I think that that's something that gets referenced I, again I really like monochrome mm -hmm. I always really kind of respond to that I remember once in a while getting a hold of issues of Vogue and looking at the editorials in the back I'd always skip to the back because that's where the craziest photo shoots always were and I used to stay up all night as a kid playing dress up with whatever I could and making these outfits that I thought of as being like for situations like that and didn't expect to ever get to be in anything like an editorial photo shoot. And so which one were you thinking that this would go with? So I think with this, with the first look for Caroline, which is kind of um, like really tailored, kind of masculine, oh, almost like an gorgeous. equestrian. It's, um, I mean, it's usually been pretty long, like between here and here. For a while, when I first moved to New York, it was below my rib cage, and then I went through a breakup and did the classic, you know, like thing, cutting it all off. I remember when I started cutting my hair the way that it was for the last record, and it was really like Linda Evangelista, kind of like 1980s, <laughs> kind of like Vogue, like when she cut all her hair off. I think when I came out, with, what set me apart from a lot of people was definitely my short blonde hair, which I had since 11th grade. A lot of people didn't know that. Like, I didn't do it when I got signed. It was something that I did when I was in high school. When I'm on tour, I can't manage short hair because it's so short. Like, when I dance a lot and I sweat, so it'll lift up. That's the only thing. So when I'm on tour, I'm like, oh, I need a weave in because I'm tired of dealing with this crap. I wanted people to see me and not forget me. Also, I just wanted, whenever I walked in the room, I wanted to be the... I wanted to be a different girl. I didn't want to look like anyone that was in the room. Um, and I think, especially back then with that hair, I definitely did that. Hold on, let me, let's fix our hair. I used to always have like bleach blonde, like super short hair, buzz cut or a pixie cut, red lipstick and I would wear all black. And like, I always felt like it didn't matter how I felt or how I really looked because I would just go on stage and people would be like, blonde, lips, black. Like that's all they would see. It would help me like get over any anxiety about performing. Uh, yeah, I, I push it this way now. I used to go that way. I've had bangs pretty much since I can remember. When I, when I go like this, just like, it's like, who is that? I tried cutting bangs last year and that didn't really work for me. I was really getting back into listening to a lot of singers like Joni Mitchell. I just didn't feel like myself, you know, because I've, I've had this hair for so long and I, I think hair for me especially on stage is sort of like a shield. The idea of giving a good haircut is not just to take the face, you have to take the body, the physique, the way person stands and also what they're willing to do with it. I mean a lot of people say oh I just want to get out of the chair and shake my head. Well good luck you know. I mean I don't know too many people that can actually do that and look good. Chrissy Hine maybe but I don't know too many other people that can do that. It takes a job of work. Grooming is a job of work, right? It's a job of work. It makes them completely confident. If my hair looks good, I can command a room and walk in and feel fabulous. If my hair looks like I've been out in the rain and it's a big, fat, frizzy mess on my head, I kind of hide in the corner. My hair is completely important to how I express myself. If I'm having a bad hair day, the whole day is messed up. Like, it's it's an attitude thing, you know, there's nothing like getting your hair done. You just feel amazing. It adds an, a confidence to you. It doesn't matter what you have on. If your hair is done, you have a different kind of confidence. I like to tease and make it really yeah, big. I like to look like we're in the 80s. I feel really confident and it's fun. I feel like a cartoon. I feel like I can say anything I want to say and talk to anyone I want to talk to and go anywhere I want to go. It transforms you. It's fun. Yeah, it transforms you. It gives you new energy. People are like, oh, you do your hair like Justin Bieber. But like, that's just because he's currently doing his hair that way. We were referencing this really exciting moment where this beautiful model, Linda Evangelista, did it. Or, you know, now Rihanna. Honestly, my hair used to be long. And I really tried a, a haircut because I actually loved it on Rihanna. I feel like when we were younger, it was like every weekend we would like change our hair. We would like get Chelsea's and like shave yeah. the back and like do weird stuff to it. When I was in sixth grade, I used to dye my hair red with a magic marker and I would wear a chain wallet. I probably thought that that was really punk at the time. I think I got over Green Day really quick.
Lorna Dune. I feel like she was maybe one of the first girls in punk that I thought of like, oh, bleached hair. Like I didn't think about that with like Nico. For some reason I just thought that was like her natural hair. Sushi in the band. Sushi. Sushi shoe. I think she was like my first crush growing up. She played at my work. She did a couple shows in a row. And my roommate at the time happened to be the green room server. So I'd already had these tattoos of her. My roommate was like, oh, you know, there's a guy that works here that is in love with you. He always want to meet you, blah, blah, whatever. He's got, you know, your eyes tattooed on him. And so she remembered that. And I was upstairs after the first show. She grabbed me and was like, let me see your arms. And I showed him to her. And then she showed all her friends that were back there. And then she asked me why, why I would ever do that. And I was like, because I really like you. Oh, OK, I have this really cool Susie shirt that was my ex-boyfriend got it, and then it didn't fit him anymore, so he gave it to me. Blondie's always been a, a, a very important icon to use as a reference. And it's because there's different periods of Blondie that you can use. I can like spend all day on YouTube looking at old Debbie Harry videos and thinking, like. All of her outfits look so cool. She looks so cool. My mom actually dated Jimmy Destry, who's the keyboard player from Blondie for many, many years. They grew up together. I remember my parents having the Parallel Lines vinyl. And she's you know, wearing that white dress, and all the guys are just looking really sharp in their, in their suits. When I saw her, I thought, I'll get punk. This is like the Marilyn Monroe of rock and roll. I bypassed the punk aspect and just photographed this fantastic young lady, you know, with the amazing face. And then, of course, um, uh, the hair which often showed the roots, which became fashionable. Although, of course, Debbie will tell you, she just couldn't be bothered to keep, like, retouching it all the time. The first record that I bought was um, definitely embarrassing. It was Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill. There was something kind of hard and bitter and angsty about her that I liked. I grew up listening to a lot of New Age music, Enya, Evangelis, anything from the Sliver soundtrack. Do you remember this old mail in record uh, catalogs, Columbia House? First time I ever bought a record was through one of those. So and when you join, you get to buy seven records for a penny. Well, I have a real clear vision. I bought a cassette single of Wilson Phillips' Hold On. Yeah. I, I feel like this is a question that always makes him look cool and me look well, sick and Wilson total more cool. Paul oh, yeah. Simon. Paul Simon Graceland. We used to dance in our living room holding hands. Yeah, the record, the vinyl. It was probably Aqua. The Aquarium, of course. I just remember like dancing around in my room to Barbie Girl. My parents being like, is he going to be OK? I thought Yanni looked cool. He had big hair and such a great stage presence. I don't know, some of like New Kids on the Block stuff, they look pretty awesome when you look back at it. It was the New Kids on the Block heat. We wore the overalls with, you know, one strap down and high tops. We had, like, mullets and we only had one earring. Now I have a greater appreciation for artists that, like, really go for it, that really go for the whole package, like Justin Timberlake. Uh, I want to learn to dance like him. Like Jackson. <laughs> he always got on his show gear no matter what. Ooh, on a TLC tip. When I saw TLC on MTV, I thought, wow, those, those girls are so cool. And I wanted to wear overalls and baby cut t-shirts and baggy pants and things like that. My sister and I used to dress up like TLC, and I was always left out, and I'd do the makeup, <laughs> and I'd put the buns. A lot of my music came from um, just hearing it in the neighborhood. A lot of it was definitely R&B, probably a lot more R&B than hip hop. I would say around 12 is when I like fell in love with like Bob Marley and N.W.A 
which is very weird. <laughs> Harder rap and hip hop from the 80s, like uh, Public Enemy and uh, NWA and Ultra Magnetic MCs. I like shooting rappers just because they come with like a look and they're comfortable in front of a camera. It's part of what they do. And they have like, sometimes, I don't know if I'm gonna call it good personal style, but they have some sort of style. I think a tape of Run DMC, Raising Hell. Shortly after that, I started getting into punk, which basically eclipsed all my previous pop tastes. The Blue Album by Weezer. Weezer. I actually have a very vivid memory of being maybe like in sixth grade, but I drew like what I wanted to look like. And it was essentially me just dressed like Reverse Cuomo, like wearing torn jeans and like, a nerdy button-up shirt and like horn-rimmed glasses and like some kind of shaggy haircut with like each detail of my outfit with like a little arrow explaining like what it would mean. When we really got like into music was really Smashing Pumpkins. I remember buying a Smashing Pumpkins poster. Fleetwood Mac. My dad was in a country band when I was a kid and, and they would cover Fleetwood Mac a lot. And of course Nirvana is like the gateway into so much good stuff. I wanted to look like Kurt Cobain. For me it was, it was Nirvana. I have two older brothers so I was informed by a lot of their choices. My brothers would bring back vinyl that they were into and I would just kind of sit in their rooms while they were listening to it. I didn't really like guitar music when I first was kind of realizing what music was, I guess. And then I think I discovered that whole Nirvana early 90s thing. That was, that hit me at the right time when I was in adolescence, I guess. And it just kind of, that then took over my life. Courtney Love and Kurt Cobain are, are used a lot, and especially this season kicking off right now with being like this massive 90s resurgent of grunge. We were definitely caught up in the kind of culture of the mid 90s grunge movement. Like we definitely dressed like kind of skaters and had big baggy clothes and wore the kind of fashions people connect with Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins and all those kinds of bands. A very, um, a wild experience was photographing Nirvana for the cover of Rolling Stone and Kurt wrote on his t-shirt when he appeared at the photo session, corporate magazines still suck. And to the great surprise, I think, of, of many, including myself, uh, the magazine ran it as is rather than retouching it out. With Kurt, people responded to that reluctance. When you stripped it away, you realized that, you know, he was just a pure artist and a pure musician. I definitely go through phases of like which older musicians I'm kind of drawn to and inspired by. You know, I really loved Ozzy Osbourne's style and, and like that very like metal hair, which I have now. And I always like joke about how I'm twins with him. loved the footage when he wore like, I think it was like a white leather fringe jacket or something, you know, where there's just like fringe all the way down. And I love the look of that and, and like the drama that's there and he's, he just looks so happy and he's throwing his arms in the air and the fringe looks amazing. So I think I'm definitely more drawn to male style and maybe, I don't know, maybe like secretly I wish I was like a man in music or something like that and I'm just more drawn to that, that side. No, I mean, David had his image. I mean, he could no, know People talk about, I say, no, David created his image. But of course, the thing that got most emphasized was this androgynous thing. The Ziggy that people think about now wasn't the original Ziggy. The original Ziggy was extremely short with a, like a little toothbrush thing at the front, long, wispy bits down the side, and the back would go like that. So we had points coming down here. And eventually, you know, it evolved into that great Ziggy haircut. The fact that uh, David Bowie has always been very androgynous is a really big reason why he's so usable as a reference in fashion, especially right now, men being used in women's shows and there's a lot of, uh, it kind of goes a lot of androgyny or even beyond a little bit more gender bending. It was really not until you know, maybe 2002, 2003, that Sarah was dating someone who ended up being our art director, and she drew up a, a board with, like, examples and was like, you need to 
focus, your style, and your design. You need an image. I have a stylist that's based in LA, and he toured with me as well. It's kind of like he know me, and he kind of know what to pull for me. A stylist is an interesting category because it's somebody that has, not only has to know who you are, but know who you might want to be and how you might want to be perceived in a perfect world. With Claire, I've always taken her pretty short with haircuts because the shape of her head is really beautiful and like, in the back of my mind, I think I've always had Grace Jones kind of in my head. I've wanted to give her that, you know what I mean? And then Jonna, I've always kind of encouraged for him to actually have longer hair because, yeah, to veer into like more of like a weird girl. The first video we did together was Psychic City, in which John and I played different archetypal characters and, and she was able to like create those characters and like really work with how they would interface with the world. And I think she created almost like not just a visual experience, but something that it was like for us both felt physical, like the clothes made us into the characters. I had it on, a, on an airplane. I was um, doodling on a cocktail napkin and I think I'd drawn someone's hair with kind of, you know, the normal light reflection thing that you do. And then it occurred to me that would be really cool if you actually got that bleached in there. And then the idea kind of sat in the back of my mind for about six months. And when it came time to shoot the I Belong in Your Arms music video, and I had this sweater vest and leather skirt that I wanted to wear for it. But I felt like it wasn't enough. Like I wanted it to be more of an anime character. And then it suddenly occurred to me, I'm gonna get this stripe bleach in my hair and call it a day. So I asked my friend Kat, who's actually gonna be styling us today, if she knew anyone that I could trust with something that permanent. And she recommended this colorist, Aura Friedman, and she killed it. It took nine hours to do this thing because it actually goes all the way through the hair instead of just sitting on one layer. And so we had to line up 30 different sections so they'd all, you know, sit next to each other. There it is. In the video, it's actually like really crisp. I, I like it more how it is now, like a little more like an animal. I never thought of myself as as a chameleon where I become this total other character and you know morph into something unrecognizable from who I really am. I sort of listen to what we're doing creatively and then think of uh, style and, and fashion that's going to you know connect with that aesthetic. It has to start with the music. The music has to be good. So we're just going to do a, a quick nail repair if you want to film any <laughs> any actual this is real life intervention. Nails are being repaired. I have changed my hair so many times. Um, and just even in my relationship right now, my, I've been with my boyfriend three years and in our vacation pictures, I don't have the same hairstyle at all. And there are times he says to me like, what girl is coming home this week? <laughs> because I changed my hair that much. My hair is just an expression. It's literally like putting on a bangle or some rings or a necklace. It's, it's my attitude for that week, that month, that day. I feel like style is really important to, I'm very natural. That's like a big part of my style. Especially like now when we're in like this whole phase of dyeing your hair, like I've never dyed my hair actually. For a while when we first started playing, I was like trying to wear fancier clothes and like skirts and stuff on stage. And I just ended up feeling ridiculous and I didn't play well. A couple of months ago, I wore a, really pair, a pair of really tall shoes. And there's this one song where I have to step on, keep repeatedly stepping on a pedal. I forgot we were going to play that song. <laughs> I 
it's at least like three inch heels. I got on heels, but I can still right. do it. I dance okay. in heels, I dance in stilettos, I All dance right, so. in wedges. On stage, I try and challenge myself to mix it up a little bit and and dress up, you know, dress up for the job. For shows, it all depends on whether I'm playing synthesizer or not. So if I'm playing synth, then it's a kind of practical decision of like, oh, it's got to get out of my face. But if I'm not playing synth, if I'm just singing, then I can have more fun with it. If I'm working like I am now, if I'm doing um, promo for an album or working on an album, then there's hair for that project. We've always sort of seen our onstage and offstage looks as being somewhat the same. We know what sort of looks best, and when you've seen hundreds of photos of yourselves from the photo pit coming up underneath your chin, you just learn how to dress and how to wear clothes that are more flattering for stage. My mother used to live and travel throughout the Far East. I've always been a collector I guess as most kids, like collecting rocks and, and other things, but I started collecting kimonos. Well, of course, since Tom of Ziggy Stardust, he got to Japan, and that fed back into Ziggy Stardust, and he was uh, very into kabuki theater. He liked taking on different personas. I wore this every day on tour, um, pretty much on and off stage and right now. <laughs> Once I get into an outfit, I'm, I'm sort of in it. I always wear the same thing when we play because for me it's like a kind of Pavlovian dog thing. Like I get the t-shirt out, I put it on and the smell kind of triggers that kind of frame of mind so I can kind of get into the zone. I've never once been on stage and looked out in the audience and thought about what anybody was wearing. Unless, no, that's just never happened. You know, there was a phase, you know, where I felt like there was a lot of attention on like, oh, your audience has the same haircut as you. They're trying to look like you. And I, we used to joke because we're like, maybe we're looking like them. I think that might just be because they happen to, they, they like the same kinds of music we do or a part of the same scene. They warn me ahead of time. Like my fans, they'll be on Twitter or something like, oh, I'll be the girl in the pink wig. <laughs> I'll be the boy in the purple skirt, you know. They, they tell me, so I always look out for it. I actually do. I love when I see young girls who are like mini-me's because I love the idea that I'm inspiring a younger generation of, of girls to, to feel empowered. You know, we're definitely aware that the kids are out in the audience and they see what we wear and they see this, the decisions that we're making and we see them sort of emulated later on in, in shows or on tours and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a little bit of acknowledgement that we're kind of learning from them and they're definitely learning from us. A long time ago when I, when I cut my hair off um, and went blonde, I saw a lot of girls do it. And to this day, there are some girls who've come up to me and said, girl, I cut my hair off because of you, which is really cool. M.I.A., of course, you know, she the one that introduced me to all of the wild colors. At first, I was kind of, I used to coordinate, like, <laughs> my shoes would have to match my shirt or something like that, but when I met her and I started doing music, um, I seen a whole new world. M.I.A. always taught me to wear everything with confidence. You know, she always said, if you wear it with confidence, nobody else can tell you anything. You know, at some point in your life, you stop idolizing strangers and famous people. You don't put posters up on your wall anymore of those people, and you replace those people with real live crushes and romance. Mm -hmm. I guess it's liberating when you realize that something looks okay and you don't need to touch it. Sometimes with music, that's a hard thing to do, like realizing that something's done and just leaving it. I think I, in particular, have a problem with not letting things be done and keep tweaking at them. I guess I, I'm not as much like that with fashion as I am with music, for better or for worse.
Mistaken for magic. 